30-year-old Ann Miller had a life most women would envy. She was attractive, she was intelligent. A successful career and a new baby, she seemed to have it all. She was definitely somebody that people saw as somewhat of a role model. And her husband was just as accomplished. They were living the perfect American dream life. But Anne and Eric's charmed life took a tragic turn as Eric became mysteriously ill. It didn't seem like, you know, they were figuring out what was wrong with him. And by the time the doctors and the police figured it out, it would be too late. They realized they were dealing with a murder. And the investigation would reveal an illicit affair, a shocking suicide, and a poisonous plot, all pointing police to one person. The more we looked, the more the story kept coming back to Ann Miller. Raleigh, North Carolina, December 2nd, 2000. 30-year-old Eric Miller was used to battling mysterious ailments. Eric was actually doing research on pediatric AIDS. But in this particular instance, Eric's battle was a lot more personal. He wasn't doing research. He was in a hospital bed fighting for his life. Even though he was sitting there, you know, deathly ill, he was downplaying it, saying that he'd be fine. Eric's doctors weren't so sure, however. It was very mystifying to all the medical people that were working, trying to, to help him, trying to save him. I mean, it's just a mystery as to why this kid's so sick. Symptoms that you would see either in the flu or some sort of food poisoning. The symptoms had first appeared more than two weeks earlier when an after-work bowling outing led to an eight-day hospital stay. He was throwing up in a bag in the bowling alley because he was trying to continue the game. His wife, Ann, said he remained violently ill, nauseous, throwing up continuously for three or four more hours until finally, early the next morning, on the morning of the 16th, she takes him to Rex Hospital. He improved, went home, and then later had a relapse and went back in the hospital. And now, all Ann could do was watch helpless as Eric's condition continued to deteriorate. Nobody's got a clue as to what's going on. But they all knew what was coming. They're not expecting him to recover. They're expecting him to die. Born in 1970, Ann Breyer stood out in the quiet rural town of Spring Grove, Pennsylvania. Ann grew up in the Midwest, small town, all-American girl. She was an athlete. She was popular. She was bright. And she was always very polished. Her outer appearance was very important to her, how she dressed, her makeup, her hair, everything down to her fingernails and toenails. She was definitely somebody that people saw as somebody, somewhat of a role model. As ambitious as she was beautiful, in 1988, 18-year-old Anne enrolled at Purdue University and set her sights on a chemistry degree. But she found her strongest chemical connection when she met fellow student, 18-year-old Eric Miller. Essentially, almost a, a perfect man. Outstanding student, very good athlete. Eric excelled at everything he did. Eric always did the right thing, was always good in school. In other words, Anne and Eric seemed like a perfect match. I distinctly remember him coming back from class one day to our apartment and saying, you know, guys, Tom, uh, I, I've met this girl. And you, you could tell, you know, instantly that he was head over heels with, you know, infatuated with her. He was very smitten. Uh, she was attractive. She was intelligent. Uh, she seemed to be very interested in the same things, you know, skiing or tennis or all the things that he liked to do. It was a pretty good fit for him. Uh, you know, she was blonde, and it just kind of looked like the Ken and Barbie type of thing. Graduating from Purdue in 1994, Eric and Anne soon married. They pursued their PhDs at North Carolina State and moved into a comfortable house in Raleigh, North Carolina. Anne wanted to go to North Carolina. Her family was already there, and he saw his future with Anne. Eric loved Anne unconditionally. You know, his, his, his life, his world revolved around uh, Anne. Not that attending NC State was a sacrifice. 
The university's PhDs commanded high pay at the private labs crowding North Carolina's research triangle. They were both pretty well satisfied with the educational opportunities and graduate school opportunities offered at NC State University. An exceptional student, Eric finished with his PhD first in 1998. He was torn. Part of him wanted to enter industry and do research and support uh, you know, the field in that way, but was really leaning towards a different direction where he could do more research uh, in the medical field. Eric ended up passing on a high dollar job with one of the Triangle's major drug manufacturers and decided to pursue a government funded research position. Rather than making big money at one of the pharmaceutical companies, he decides to take a federal grant and work on pediatric AIDS. He was just the kind of guy that really cared about children, really cared about making a difference in the world, and he was so proud of the work that he was doing. But with Anne still pursuing her PhD at NC State, life wasn't easy for the young couple. Eric wasn't making a whole lot of money as a research fellow. None of them do. And the couple struggled even more when Anne became pregnant. Eric's family was constantly loaning them money, giving them money, and it was never enough. So after the birth of their daughter in 2000, Anne, now 30, dropped out of her PhD program and used her master's degree in biochemistry to get a job with one of the area's top pharmaceutical companies. She took a job there as a research scientist doing work in the laboratory at Glaxo Welcome. It was exactly the type of high-paying job Eric had turned down. She went to work to have, you know, some of the nicer material things in life. I mean, a nicer house, uh, nicer cars. They used Anne's salary to buy a bigger home. It was a nice two-story, brand-new house. They were living the, you know, the perfect American, American dream life. There was a downside, though. Anne's busy work schedule meant she spent less time with her daughter. Eric did everything. Eric cared for his daughter, you know, feeding and, and the diapers. Anne's new job brought other changes, too. She had some, um, you know, cosmetic surgery on her chest, and she also had lots of other kind of beauty treatments. Eric appreciated Anne's new look, but on all those nights that Anne worked late and left him alone with the baby, he began to wonder, was he the only one? Maybe there was some issue of Anne working around an environment that was primarily men, and maybe you know, it was getting um, a little bit uncomfortable for him, for his wife to be working around men all the time. Was it possible that Anne was having an affair, or was Eric overreacting? After all, few of Anne's fellow researchers had her husband's good looks, and most, like co-worker Daryl Willard, were married. Daryl was very much of, I guess you, for lack of a better word, a geek that was very good in chemistry, but maybe not other things. Anne had even seen Daryl outside of work, but it appeared to be entirely innocent. Several of the people that worked at Glaxo had started going bowling outings. Anne had gone a couple of times. Eric had even gone with her on a few of the outings, but his trip to the bowling alley on the night of November 15th, 2000 would be his last cut short by the mysterious and eventually fatal symptoms. To ease Eric's concerns about her male co-workers, Anne insisted Eric attend a guy's night out at a local bowling alley with Daryl Willard and a few colleagues. Anne's justification, well, if you go out and, you know, start getting involved in various activities with these guys I work with, then you'll feel more comfortable. Eric tried to be enthusiastic even when it became obvious they'd picked the wrong night for bowling. Everybody knows if you're going in to bowl with two or three, four friends, you don't do it on league night because all the lanes are gonna be taken. The group ended up having to wait for a lane. Everybody goes over to the snack bar, they order hot dogs and whatnot. The men decide to get some beer. Daryl Willard then goes and purchases that beer. Eric tastes his beer and says, hmm, this beer tastes kind of funky. The other co-worker, who had already, you know, sipped some of his beer, said, hey, that's just bowling alley beer. And at some point, the cup of beer that Eric's drinking from gets tipped over. 
But midway through the game, Eric was suddenly struck down by a bizarre and painful stomach ailment. He's having to bowl with one hand and puke into a trash can with the other. He went home and his wife eventually drove him to the emergency room. Admitted into Raleigh's Rex Hospital, the doctors initially assumed it was something Eric had eaten. The physical effects of whatever was going on with him at the time were like intestinal. Was it simply food poisoning or was it something else? The initial suspicions were that perhaps he'd been exposed to some um, strain of virus or bacteria at work. He works in an environment that's very rich in, I mean, exotic viruses. The doctors at Rex ran multiple tests, but couldn't seem to find a cause for his illness. They put him through so much, it was just, it was just heartbreaking. You know, blood tests, uh, bone marrow, which is probably very, very painful. Eric was moved to Rex's ICU, but after five days with no improvement, he was transferred to the University of North Carolina Hospital. They make arrangements and transfer him from Rex to UNC Memorial Hospital over in Chapel Hill, primarily because labs are faster. They've got much more, you know, advanced laboratory capabilities at, at that large research hospital than they do at, at Rex. The doctors at UNC were no closer to figuring out what was wrong than their colleagues at Rex had been. But slowly, with Anne by his side, Eric's condition started to improve. He was able to be moved out of ICU by, I think it might have been like Thanksgiving night. I know by Friday he was eating and sitting up, trying to get up out of the bed. And on November 24th, after almost 10 days in the hospital, Eric was finally well enough that his doctors sent him home. On Thursday of that week, he actually takes a, a short walk around his little cul-de-sac neighborhood that he lives in. I mean, he's showing lots of signs of improvement. The doctors had never identified his mysterious ailment, however. And on November 30th, just six days after his homecoming, Anne would once again be rushing Eric to the hospital. He ends up getting taken back to Rex Hospital, the emergency room, because these symptoms have reoccurred. Coming up, the doctors make a startling discovery. Someone was trying to kill him. And the police search for the perpetrator. You know, what kind of person could do something like this? Released from a Raleigh, North Carolina hospital after battling a mysterious illness, Eric Miller had spent the last six days recovering at home with his wife, Anne, by his side. He started to really come around. In fact, he was eating. He had seen his regular doctor. Uh, he had been doing a teeny little bit of exercise walking. On the evening of November 30th, Eric had even felt well enough to celebrate his recovery. He and Anne had gone out for a romantic dinner. But during the meal, he had suffered a sudden, severe relapse. He's having explosive nausea. You know, I mean, it's like somebody's just wrenching out his, his insides. Anne rushed Eric back to Raleigh's Rex Hospital. But the doctors there were just as mystified as ever. It was just very, very frustrating. And it didn't seem like, you know, they were figuring out what was wrong with him. Over the next 24 hours, Eric's condition continued to worsen. I remember him saying that, you know, he saw a, like a devil or a Red Bull, and he was just, he was hallucinating. He was seeing things that, that wasn't there. As he hallucinated, the doctors and even his sister had to restrain Eric. He literally was thrashing on the table, and I remember laying on top of him and putting my body on top of him and trying just to calm him down and tell him that it would be okay. After more than two weeks of wondering whether her husband of seven years would live or die, it was more than Anne could take. And she's like, I, I, I just gotta get out of here. I gotta get out right now. I can't take this anymore. And she just ran out of the room. There was little Anne or any of the doctors could do. It was rapidly becoming clear that this hospital stay would be Eric's last. He started having problems with his vitals. They couldn't figure it out. Then, on the evening of December 1st, a breakthrough. Eric's doctors discovered a mislabeled test result from his previous hospital stay. After weeks of speculation, 
they finally knew what was killing Eric Miller. And the reports come back from UNC Hospital to Rex Hospital in Raleigh. Uh, they're saying, hey, this is arsenic. They determine, based on those test results, hey, this guy's got huge amounts of arsenic. At that point, they didn't know if he was poisoned or if it was an environmental cause. But since it could be poison, the hospital immediately contacted the Raleigh Police Department with the information. Although by the time detectives arrived at the hospital, it was too late. By the time we, you know, get out there, try to interview Eric, he's not in a position or able to provide us with a whole lot of information. Instead, when the police tried to limit access to the room, Eric used what little strength he had left to ask for Anne. And Eric said, oh no, I've got to have Anne. With Anne at his side, Eric Miller died early the next morning. He was only 30 years old. The next morning, both Eric's and Anne's families gathered at the Miller home as Anne began making funeral arrangements for her late husband. Meanwhile, Raleigh detectives went to Eric's lab, hoping to find the source of the arsenic. He was a scientist, so obviously the first thought is, well, maybe he came in contact with something where he worked. But the detectives found no evidence that Eric could have been accidentally exposed to arsenic while working at the lab. They realized they were dealing with a murder case. This is somebody intentionally giving him arsenic in an effort to poison him. But who? Once again, the investigation started at Eric's lab. I mean, we looked at Eric's co-workers, looked throughout Eric's background, trying to find some, you know, some hint of a, a you know, something that was hidden in his, in his lifestyle, in his background, that would lead somebody to do this to him. The investigators also had to rule out Eric's wife, Anne. Obtaining a warrant to search the Miller home, they failed to find any arsenic. But searching Anne's lab two days later, the police did find an arsenic compound called sodium cacodylic, which on its own wasn't all that suspicious. In a research laboratory, I think that that was available. That certainly would have been an issue that it's something that maybe ordinary folks didn't have access to, but she was in a position to have. However, evidence of arsenic wasn't all the search turned up. When we cracked open Ann's work computer, we were able to determine, hey, you know, this girl, she's been having affairs. Based on what the police found on Ann's computer, she had been having an affair with a married co-worker named Daryl Willard. There was uncovered a lot of emails between Ann and Daryl, which obviously appeared to be romantic in nature. Was it a coincidence that Ann and Daryl's affair seemed to parallel Eric's mysterious illness? They first started getting together in October of 2000. The lovers had even spent a weekend together in early November. We discovered records indicating that Ann and Daryl had flown on the same airplane, seats side by side, to Chicago. And it wasn't a business trip. They took off on a Friday afternoon, checked into the Ritz-Carlton later in the day on Friday, registered as Mr. and Mrs. Daryl Willard, spent the weekend there ordering an awful lot of room service, and then flew back into Raleigh on Sunday. Four days later, Eric fell ill for the first time. But did the affair with Daryl Willard prove Anne had killed her husband? After all, she wasn't with Eric at the bowling alley when the first poisoning symptoms appeared. Eric Miller is bowling with Anne's colleagues, with Anne's friends, and one of them is Daryl Willard. Questioning Anne and Daryl's co-workers over the next few days, the police discovered that Eric had been out with his wife's co-workers before. But his last trip to the bowling alley had been different, largely because it had been Daryl's idea. Everybody said this was very unusual that Daryl had put all this together. I mean, he had gone along on several that had been set up by other people that work, he worked with, but he had never set one up. It just wasn't his, it wasn't, Daryl wasn't the kind of guy to do this. Even more unusual, Daryl had bought everyone a round of beer while they waited for a lane to open up. Daryl goes over to the bar and orders a pitcher of beer. He comes back with three cups of beer and a pitcher, 
Beer's already poured in the cups. Daryl serves the beer. Daryl Willard hands the beer to each person, including Eric Miller. And as several co-workers were called, there had been something wrong with Eric's beer. Eric tastes his beer and says, hmm, this beer tastes kind of funky. At the time, Ann's co-workers hadn't thought much of it. The other co-worker, who had already you know, sipped some of his beer, said, hey, that's just Bowling Alley beer. I mean, it's not the best stuff in the world. Um, you know, it's okay, though. But now, investigators couldn't help but wonder, had Daryl Willard served Eric more than just Bowling Alley beer? Shortly after drinking that beer, Eric Miller became violently ill. In fact, they said he was throwing up in a bag in the bowling alley because he was trying to continue the game. For police, the timing pointed to just one possibility. Daryl obviously poisoned uh, Eric at the bowling alley. Coming up, Raleigh police questioned Daryl Willard. Daryl comes to the doors fully expecting to go to jail. And the case takes a shocking turn. All of a sudden, this person in connection with the murder investigation was dead. Raleigh, North Carolina, December 5th, 2000. Ann Miller's husband, Eric, had been dead for three days, poisoned by arsenic. And while the Raleigh police initially suspected Ann may have been behind her husband's murder, Eric Miller's family was adamant that she was innocent. Right after Eric's death, uh, Eric's family is very protective of Ann, very angry at the police department for uh, even looking at Ann, even talking to Ann. You no, know, it couldn't have been Ann. You know, Eric loved her. Eric, Eric wouldn't have picked somebody like that. And if there were any lingering doubts about Ann's love for Eric, her behavior at the service seemed to put those to rest. Ann was incredibly emotional and upset and um, the crying was more like wailing and it just, it was just um, overwhelming. I walked away feeling guilty for thinking that um, she was somehow involved. Following the service, Anne was inconsolable, sobbing one word over and over. Why? The critical question in any homicide investigation is always why? Why is this person been murdered and from why you get who but even as Ann sobbed Raleigh police thought they knew the answer on December 4th the day before the service the investigators had uncovered emails and other evidence suggesting that Ann had been having an affair with a co-worker named Daryl Willard they were colleagues, they worked side by side, and eventually, sometime investigators believe uh, in the fall of 2000, she developed what appeared to be a romantic relationship with him. It was only a few weeks later that Eric had first fallen ill, after he had gone out for beers with several of Anne's male co-workers, including Willard. Based on the clinical symptoms that Eric presented, over the next few hours and into the next day that that was probably when the arsenic was delivered to him in that cup of beer. On Sunday morning, January 21st, nearly two months after Eric's death, Raleigh police knocked on Daryl Willard's front door. He appeared to be expecting them. Daryl comes to the door and Daryl has the distinct look on his face of someone who was fully expecting to go to jail, that the next thing that was gonna happen was I was gonna reach out with a pair of handcuffs and handcuff him. While officers searched through the house, Detective Chris Morgan took Daryl aside for questioning. Myself and one of my detectives went out in the car with Daryl. He had a seat in the back. Questioned by the detectives, Daryl insisted he had nothing to do with Eric Miller's death. But Detective Morgan suspected he was hiding something. I said, Daryl, I'll be honest with you. From the phone records, from the emails, from everything that I know about this case, I think you've been used by a woman. Daryl Willard looked up at me and said, yeah, and she did a good job of it. But just as he appeared to be on the verge of a confession, 
Daryl ended the interview. The next thing out of his mouth was, I can't talk to you anymore. I've got to call my lawyer. The search of the house failed to produce any traces of arsenic. With insufficient evidence to make an arrest, the detectives told Daryl he was free to go. At 5.30 the following afternoon, Daryl Willard's wife, Yvette, pulled her car into the driveway of the couple's home. When she walked into the garage, she made a horrifying discovery. The very next day, after the search had taken place and the search warrants had become public in the local newspaper, uh, Daryl Willard committed suicide. Daryl shot himself. It was a pretty clear-cut case of suicide. There wasn't any suspicion that there had been anyone else involved. In a note left tacked to the wall, Daryl Willard had written an apology to his family. He also explained that he had been wrongly accused of Eric Miller's death. With their prime suspect dead, the investigation had hit a huge roadblock. And the authorities began to worry whether they would ever get the evidence to bring Eric's killer to justice. I had a conversation with a, a, a newspaper reporter, a very good friend of mine, and he told me, it's too far gone. You know, your natural witness killed himself. We didn't have sufficient evidence to proceed on a charge, and so we were scrambling, trying to find any way that we could possibly get sufficient evidence of what happened. Hoping to get the case back on track, the cops went to question Daryl's widow, Yvette, the next day. She said, Daryl confessed he had an affair with Ann to me. He told me that he didn't have anything to do with Eric's death. And he told me that he had been to see the lawyer, Rick Gammon. That much the investigators already knew. But then Yvette dropped a bombshell. Rick Gammon told him that he could be charged with attempted murder. That led us to believe that he had shared information with Rick Gammon that might have in some way inculpated him or Ms. Miller. Unfortunately, Daryl Willard hadn't told his wife just what he'd said to his attorney, leaving police with only one option. We've got to find a way to make Rick Gammon tell us what Daryl told him. But when the detectives went to Rick Gammon and requested the information, he refused citing attorney-client privilege. Rick, who's a wonderful man, a wonderful attorney, is bound by his legal ethics and that you say nothing from your clients. Undeterred, the investigators and the Wake County District Attorney's Office sought a court order for the release of Gammon's notes. In their filing, they argued that the need to protect Daryl Willard's confidentiality ended with his death, a position his attorney vehemently opposed. When you tell your lawyer something, um, you have the assurance that it's confidential and um, that it will not be shared. As the legal battle shaped up, Ann Miller packed her bags, took her one-year-old daughter, and moved in with her sister in Wilmington on the North Carolina coast. She wanted to get away from Raleigh. I think she wanted to get away from the attention that this case had become so high profiled. But soon after Ann left town, new information would send speculation about Eric's death into overdrive, and it would have the investigators wondering whether Ann would get away with murder. On May 10, 2001, six months after Eric Miller died in a Raleigh hospital, the investigators received the coroner's report on his death. To their surprise, they learned that Eric had somehow received a final dose of arsenic after he had been admitted to the hospital. But that wasn't the only shocking news. Strands of Eric's hair indicated exactly when the poisoning had started. He had been receiving small doses of arsenic for a long period of time. At least five to six months worth of time in which he was getting um, some sort of arsenic put into his system. Ann is the only one that had the constant access to, to Eric to give him all these doses. However, according to the coroner, those small, early doses weren't enough to kill him. It was almost like she sort of played around with it in the beginning, a little dose here, a little dose there, and then, but then when it gets really into the, the late fall and the winters where she really becomes very serious with, with it and decides to give him the fatal dose. The investigators believe the first attempt on Eric's life had come on November 15, 2000. That was the night Eric had gone out for beers with Anne's lover, Daryl Willard. 
We think Ann had talked Daryl into poisoning Eric. And, and I think based on the fact that he ended up killing himself, I think he realized that he was in over his head and he had been manipulated beyond things that he would normally do. But because his beer had spilled at the bowling alley, Eric had survived the first poisoning attempt. Apparently, Eric didn't get the level of dose that would have killed him. Then, a few weeks later, he fell fatally ill after he and Ann celebrated his release from the hospital. They went out to dinner. The only person alone with Eric at the time was Ann. Coming up, prosecutors keep fighting for information from Daryl's attorney. They wanted to make sure they had every nail in the coffin. But would it be enough to prosecute Ann? At no point until we had that information did we feel like we could go forward. By spring of 2004, Ann Miller had done a lot to put her husband Eric's death behind her. Not only had she left Raleigh with her one-year-old daughter and moved to Wilmington, she was no longer Ann Miller. In November of 2003, almost three years after Eric's death, she'd married a man named Paul Kantz. He was in a Christian rock band, and she kind of settled into a very domestic life. But whether she called herself Ann Miller or Ann Kantz, Raleigh Police and the Wake County District Attorney's Office still considered her the prime suspect in Eric's poisoning. The more we looked, the more the story kept coming back to Ann Miller. You know, each time he got sick, she was the person who was there that would have pointed to her being the person to give him the arsenic. Investigators had shared their suspicions with Eric Miller's family. However, there was one small problem. We didn't have sufficient evidence to proceed on the charge. It was all very circumstantial, and they wanted to make sure they had every nail in the coffin before that they drug her in or charged her. Specifically, the prosecutors wanted evidence that put the poison in Ann's hands, and the DA's office believed someone just might have that evidence. Rick Gammon, the attorney for Ann's deceased lover, Daryl Willard. Shortly before Daryl Willard killed himself, he went to talk to Rick Gammon about the case. Rick Gammon told him that he could face attempted murder charges. Daryl had shared that bit of information with his wife, who shared it with the police. But she didn't know what Daryl had told the attorney about Eric's death. I mean, let's assume that Daryl Willard tells his lawyer the truth. Whatever he tells him, Rick in return is telling him he could be charged with attempted murder. He's going to have to have some basis in fact for making that prediction. Whatever those incriminating details were, could they also incriminate Ann? With Daryl dead, only Gammon knew for sure, and the attorney wasn't talking. Because of attorney-client privilege, there was no way you could get at that information unless a judge ordered him to give that information up. So the Wake County DA's office had filed a motion requesting that Gammon release his records. There was a long protracted battle to keep this information private. And the legal debate over attorney-client privilege all hinged on one complicated question. Does it transcend death? Finally, after almost two years of legal wrangling, the question went before the North Carolina Supreme Court in May of 2004. And they presented a very powerful argument that attorney-client privilege, even after death, could never be breached. The justices disagreed. Since there was no danger of incriminating his now deceased client, the state Supreme Court ruled that Gammon had to reveal the contents of his conversation with Daryl. It was a very narrowly defined case, but it gave us what we needed. On May 27th, Rick Gammon hand-delivered notes from his conversation with Daryl Willard to the authorities. When the investigators read the contents, Gammon's notes confirmed that it was Anne who had been poisoning her husband. In fact, according to what Daryl told his attorney, Anne had given Eric a final dose of arsenic shortly before his death. She had administered a dose of arsenic to her husband while he was hospitalized in his final hospitalization. Daryl didn't witness Anne delivering the fatal dose to her husband, but according to paragraph 12 of Gammon's notes, she had confessed to it while Eric lay dying in his hospital bed. 
Daryl Willard told Mr. Gamma that he had met Ann Miller in the parking lot of the hospital while Eric was being treated there, and she had gotten into the SUV, and they were sitting there, and she held up a syringe that was empty. And she said, I just used this to inject poison into Eric's IV. That conversation was a smoking pistol. Finally, after years of waiting, the prosecutors felt they had enough for a murder indictment. At no point until we had that information did we feel like we could go forward in terms of presenting this case to um, a grand jury to, to start the proceedings. On September 27th, nearly four years after Eric first fell ill, the Wake County grand jury indicted Ann Miller Conz for murder. Rick Gammon really was the key to blowing this whole case wide open. That same day, Anne returned to Raleigh and turned herself in at police headquarters. Somebody asked, aren't you happy? I said, two men are laying dead in the ground. What in the hell is there to be happy about? You're not happy, but at, at least there's some feeling that we might have some justice. Eric's family no longer defended Anne, but they didn't know exactly what Gammon's notes had revealed about Eric's death. And when she appeared in court for her bond hearing on December 10th, it was apparent that Anne didn't know either. She full well thought that she would be getting out on bail. It was evident by the look on her face. She was all done up, her hair was done and curled. She walked into the courtroom like she was you know, a movie star, waving at the family, smiling, hi, I love you, to her family. She was all smiles that day because she thought this was it. But Anne's smile vanished when Rick Gammon was called into the courtroom along with his notes. When Rick Gammon brought, literally brought paragraph 12 to the courthouse, he was met in the elevator by media just staring at the envelope, you know, like we could actually maybe hopefully glean what was in that envelope by just looking through it. They wouldn't have long to wait. That afternoon, the prosecutors read the explosive contents of paragraph 12 in open court. She had used a syringe and put poison in Eric's IV while he was still at Rex Hospital. That was the first time we had heard that, so it was news to us, too. And it was just, it was unbelievable because it was so decisive. At the end of the hearing, the judge set Ann's bond at $3 million. She would be staying put, so we, of course, were ecstatic. Ann, on the other hand, appeared far less thrilled at the prospect of sitting in jail. Finally. You at least saw on her face a little bit of seriousness or somberness, but it was because she didn't get what she wanted. With Anne behind bars, police and the district attorney's office began building their case for trial. They knew they had an uphill fight. Winning over the judge at Anne's bond hearing was one thing, but could they convince a jury to convict a 34-year-old mother of murder? There was no criminal history. She was an educated person. She may have been sympathetic to some folks. And Anne was sure to play on that sympathy. If the investigation had proved anything, it was that she was a master manipulator. She was a chameleon. She could appear seductive one minute, and, I mean, she would look like a Puritan the next minute. There was a real fear that you put her in front of a jury and people are going to feel sorry for her. It scared me. It really scared me. Going into a room with 12 good citizens of Wake County who are still human, it scared the hell out of me. When Ann walked into a North Carolina courtroom on November 7, 2005, she faced the possibility of life in prison. In fact, Ann had already spent most of the past year behind bars, unable to make bail. She was given a $3 million bond, which was obviously too high and too high for most people to make. She was then transferred to women's prison because there was a feeling that she was going to be in prison for quite a long time waiting for trial. But could the prosecutors keep her in prison permanently? In terms of the scientific evidence and being able to pinpoint exactly when doses were given, there, there were some, there gonna be some difficulties in terms of, of proof in this case. The prosecutors would never have to make their case. Anne had come to court that morning to plead guilty to second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder in exchange for a minimum of 25 years in prison. 
I felt like given everything that we had and what we knew in terms of difficulties in trying this case, that it was an appropriate resolution of the case. Eric's family had agreed to the plea deal, although the hearing held little in the way of closure for them. This was the first time that our family got to read our victim statements and it got to address her in some direct fashion. And it wasn't as satisfying as you might think. My one daughter asked, gosh, and why? Why? Why didn't you divorce him? Why take his life? But Anne never answered her former in-law's questions. This was not a woman that killed for money. There was a very small life insurance policy. So that kind of is always going to be the mystery about this case. And Anne's formal statement offered little in the way of an explanation or apology. They were empty words. There was no regret. There still is no regret. The only thing she regrets is that she got caught. But after five years of investigation, the police were pleased to see Eric's killer brought to justice. To admit that she killed her husband was something that investigators had waited a long time to hear. And for those investigators, this case is a reminder that when it comes to murder, appearances can be deceiving. Evil doesn't always appear with horns and a tail. Sometimes it can be a demure, well-educated, well-spoken suburbanite housewife who appears on the outside to be all sunshine and roses and dark-hearted as they come on the inside.